Yo, what's up, guys? Welcome back to the Sobriety University podcast. Uh, really excited for this one. We have an awesome guest, uh, a new homie of mine, and I'm really excited to have him on the channel to talk about his journey with marijuana. Uh, a lot of you guys, you know, you're here for the weed stuff. So we have somebody that's been through the weeds and has gotten out of the weeds. So, <laughs> Derek, thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, dude, my pleasure. I've been uh, looking forward to this for a long time. Cool. Awesome. Well, yeah, guys. So today we're going to you know, dive into Derek's story a bit. And before we begin, uh, we don't want to keep you waiting too long. Feel free to post any questions or comments that you have for Derek. And we will get to those maybe midstream and just uh, kind of do like a live Q&A. So Derek, uh, first question, what got you into marijuana? I wanted to be popular. <laughs> <laughs> was that the root of it? Good podcast. And I was in high school. I was 17. And uh, yeah, like the people that I wanted to hang out with. So I thought, uh, you know, they, they all already smoked. I was like a, the only new one when the first time that I ever did it with this crew. And I remember just freaking out, uh, okay. did not have a good experience. So it took me a few months before I wanted to do it again. But yeah, I mean, all, all the cool kids were doing it and I'd be lying if I said anything other than like, I was really wanting to be popular. Like I had just moved there. Uh, from California to Colorado. So I, I lived in like the two major weed states. Uh, and then especially Colorado, I mean, it was getting legalized. My senior year of high school is when it got legalized and they opened up their first store uh, for medical. And like every 18 year old had a medical card because you didn't, you just had to say that your neck hurt and you got one. So yeah, dude, my whole school was full of stoners and uh, it, it was hard to avoid, but that, once you get, I got started and like, I started smoking at lunch too, before coming back to school and each time was an adventure. And I definitely didn't say anything the remainder of the day in any of those classes, but every day we're like, Let, let's do it again. You know, you kind of forget why uh, you said not to do it before when you were so high going back to school and we're like, yeah, we can handle it this time. And yeah, dude, I just kept going from there. Yeah, it's interesting that you said that you smoked for the first time and you didn't get high. I think people fall into one or two camps where they just get, I got blazed. No, I did. I got oh, you way did too it. high. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that wrong then. Yes. Because it seems like what I've seen is people that don't get high right away, they actually don't usually continue with it. Like it's rare that they keep pushing through. Mm. So it sounds like though you were a natural stoner from, from first puff. Yeah. There's that whole thing. Like you can't get high the first time. I think it's just, you didn't inhale. And you didn't really want to. You're just like, uh, they're making me. And then you just like blew it out real quick. But they uh, weren't okay. taking it serious is, <laughs> is more what I'm thinking happened. I, I don't think the chemical side of it really makes sense. Like, oh, yeah, THC doesn't work the first time your uh, body's yeah. exposed to it. It doesn't really make sense to me. Um, but and yeah. So, yeah. And, very so, <laughs> and so, yeah, you said you want to be popular, man. Like, I can relate to that 100%. Like, uh, in elementary school, I was not the cool kid was not good at sports. And as you know, back in, back in the nineties, you had to be a, you know, an athlete to be a cool kid. So how did maybe marijuana help your social anxiety or help you fit in? Uh, the crowd that I got into, we were, you know, th there's a few stoner crews because I mean, Colorado, like there were so many, like uh, even like the kids that weren't like the quote unquote cool kids smoked weed sometimes. Um, but yeah, just the the people that I clicked with, we and I still talk to them today too. So it's not like the the friendship was completely built on marijuana, hmm. um, but yeah, I just got along with them well, and uh, that was just always what we did. And really, like every weekend was just like we get out of school on Friday, we're like woo, like, and then we just smoke, and then we'd be like, all right, we're too high to go in anywhere, and we don't have any money, so we'll just like stay in the car. And all of our parents think we're at a movie right now. And let's tell them we're at another movie. <laughs> like we just do nothing, you know? So it, it, yeah, it, it definitely was frustrating. Like when you're a stoner before anyone even has a house, then you're just sitting in a car somewhere or sitting in a park. So it's pretty uneventful. Yeah. Mom, we're, we're seeing seven movies tonight. So just you know, get, yeah. get out of some slack. How were they? Good. <laughs> so good. <too. laughs> yeah. I'd like be looking up online, like what happens? <laughs> <laughs> So, so cool. So we, we kind of touched on that a bit. Let's let's move forward. So when after high school, how did your weed use progress? I, I really never stopped. So once I moved out like right at 18, then my roommate 
was one of the people who had a med card. He was always re up and he was, you know, distributing it too. So like I, it was always right there. Like, uh, and then my other roommate smoked as well. So uh, yeah, it was always around. And then all of my friends in college smoked all the time too. And once I got out of my parents' house and it was just like, okay, like I'm waking up in my own apartment. Then I started getting into wake and baking and just uh, like, all right, I'll just go to high to every class, even though I would just sit there and just like not pay attention. Like for whatever reason, I would just wake up and I'd be like, should I go? Should I get high for class today? And I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. why not? Uh, and yeah, I would just, you know, go to college and then and do that. And then and then you get to go drinking on the weekends. And um, yeah, I mean, I had a, a typical college experience with the partying and everything. But I definitely smoked weed throughout all of the academic parts as well. And then then you just get so used to being high that you become a functional stoner. Mm. And then I got into a sales job, which my was my first taste of entrepreneurship when I was 21. And I, I did really well with it, despite being a stoner the whole time. And uh, like I was still super motivated. I, I I've always had ADHD, so mm. I think. That's why weed worked really well for me. It was a good escape from being just so hyperactive and just calming myself down. I'm very extroverted. So it was a way to make myself more introverted. Hmm. And it, it did really work well with my lifestyle until I had other things going on that could be a bigger purpose. Like I would do... I would go to my sales appointments high sometimes and I'd be like, that was not a good idea. You know, I'd get out of there and like, be like, I, I probably could have sold them something if I was a little bit sharper. And then, then, then after a few years, like four or five, you finally get to the point where you set the sales approach so many times that you're like, now, now it can be a little bit more high and, and get mm -hmm. away with it. So I was always just trying to get away with it, man. I never really, okay. I never saw it as a problem. I always just saw it as, okay, let's smoke a little less next time or make sure you have your last hit be an hour 45 before the appointment rather than an hour and a half. Mm. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Like I never addressed the problem as like stop smoking weed. And, and if someone brought it up to me, dude, I was just like not having it. So I, I never even considered getting rid of it because uh, I really did enjoy it so much. And I'm not going to say that today, like if I would smoke right now, um, apart from the guilt I would feel from breaking my streak and just knowing that I declared that that's not part of my life. I know I could enjoy it. Uh, so that was a large part of getting rid of it. I had to be like, look, I do love it. Um, that's, but it's just not what I can do anymore. It wasn't me like, you know what, screw this stuff because that doesn't last. You have to kind of get, uh, get on actual terms with it. Like, no, it was really fun and I would still enjoy it today, but it's a, you, you see what you're really trading off. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, so I got that sales job and I still would like do all like five or six appointments in a day, come home, smoke, wake up, make a bunch of phone calls, do a bunch of appointments and take little hits like along the way. I love that I was my own boss because it was in, in I was an independent contractor and it was work as much or as little as you want to. So I couldn't get fired. I, as long as I'm in sales, I can't get fired. There's no drug tests either. They're not going to fire me, even if I would fail. And all the other salesmen smoke too. So uh, <laughs> I found a job that you could get away with it, right? Because I remember when I graduated college and I was like, take a drug test. I was like, I don't care what you pay me. Like if you were going to monitor my weed consumption, like I'm staying in sales. So a lot of like my entrepreneurship journey, like initially was... I didn't even see these other jobs as an option because I mean, I, I did the, the job interviews with fake pee strapped to my leg, <laughs> but, wow. um, but yeah, I was like, I'm not going clean for 30 to 40 days to take your test or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I was, I've been defiant for, for most of my life. I've always been wanting to be in control uh, of everything, which is a pro and a con, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, that that's kind of my personality with weed. You know, a really important point you touched on was that you did admit you loved it. And I think that's really important because, you, like you said, you're not like weed's the enemy, weed's evil. You're just like, you know, we, we had a great relationship, Mary Jane and I. We had a lot of fun, but it's we're, we're growing apart. It's no longer yeah. healthy. And I think that's really important for people that are trying to quit to to acknowledge that and just to be like, 
you know, not beat yourself up for lo- loving weed and for having loved weed. I was, I was well loved weed. It made me, it expanded my consciousness. It brought me closer to people. But just as you said, at one point, it stopped doing that. And that one was like, okay, this is a red flag. So when was that moment for you? Sounds like you're being very successful. You're, yeah, good job. You know, it's funny because I always joked with my buddy when we were in sales and we were smoking and I was still like, I'm never quitting. I'll be smoking until the day I die. I, I had that mentality. I was like, if I ever do quit, I bet it will be something like this. Like I absolutely crushed it when I smoked weed, but then I just freaking slayed it when I stopped. Like I, I was like, I'm always like pretty damn good. Uh, but, I, but I knew like I would, I would do a lot of public speaking with this sales job. And if I would try to do practice runs high, I couldn't do it. So I could always see it's not a performance enhancing drug. It is certainly not helping. I am just making it work anyways. And maybe I would do like Adderall or lots of caffeine, just really, you know, uh, Ritalin, like whatever, just to always counteract the weed. And uh, yeah, but there's a lot of times where I was like, I need to prepare for my speech, but I'm a little too high right now. So I'm going to wait an hour and a half and drink this coffee. And there was a lot of time wasted where I was like waiting for myself to come down so that I could Hmm. do other things. But ultimately where, when I said, I actually do need to quit. The first time was in 2020 and I was struggling to get over a breakup and I had broken up with her actually. But after like six months after you break up with someone is that point where you say, wait, what did I not like about them? (laughs) And, and especially in 2020, dude, like Uh, when everyone's lonely. So I was like, I started realizing like what parts of the relationship I had fault in. And she was someone who was very quirky, high energy and that gets uh, that gets along with me very well um however if i'm high no it doesn't because mm-hmm. when you're high at the grocery store you're like everyone knows i'm high here like don't <laughs> draw attention to to us right but then she would be like the loudest person in the grocery store like the loudest person everywhere we went okay and when i was sober i was fine with it and then when i was high i was like chill out like i'm trying to not draw attention to me right now i'm high right now right so i realized that I got really annoyed with her. And that was ultimately why I ended the relationship. Like she just annoyed me a lot. And that was a lot because of the weed I smoked. And even uh, my parents too, I realized uh, like little things they do, I'd be like, it it would annoy me more than it should, right? Like I'd get annoyed um, by things hanging out with them, but I don't get annoyed by anymore. And I really realized that it makes you very irritable when other people around you aren't acting in the way that you want them to, but Mm -hmm. they're not high. So they're not matching your energy, right? If you go out with your buddies and you're all high, you're all kind of like, let's just all stick to ourselves and and you kind of get it. And you're not like trying to communicate outside of your group that much, but I was just always high. Right. And, and (laughs) beginning of the relationship, when you start dating someone, even if you are a pot addict, you're not smoking on those dates, right? You're just like, you're usually putting it away unless they smoke too. You're like, okay, cool. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm meeting up with this girl. I'm I'm not going to be high, right? So like for the first like few months, I was not high. And then eventually I was like, okay, cool. Now that we're dating, uh, I, I get high all the time, by the way. <laughs> you know, so, and, and she said she was cool with it. Like, I think a lot of girls say they're cool with it until mm, the little things cool. start to come up yeah. where they're like, like one time I was like smoking a J on the way to McDonald's and then we almost got pulled over. And, uh, and that made her so mad because she was like, you almost got me like in trouble with the law, right. With this situation. So like we started running into things like that where I'd be like, uh, like, no, I'm not going to give the car to the valet person. I just hot boxed it in here. Like just little (laughs) things just start to add up. And, uh, you just realize that you really do make it an inconvenience on someone else. I've only dated one girl that also was a pothead. And it was fun, but also at the same time, you know, they, they had some, some issues too, like, like I did that I had to address. So, um, it, it's not that everyone who smokes weed all the time, it has internal issues, but it is likely that there is some reason that we are using some form of escapism all the time. So we'll talk about that. Uh, but ultimately I realized that the girls that I do want to date, um, although I don't have a problem with stoner girls, like it's rare that I'm there. Very few of the girls that I'm attracted to are stoner girls mm-hmm. at the end of the day. So I was like, all the girls that I actually am attracted to, 
Um, this is not helping me. So that was the first time in 2020 and I made it 50 days, uh, without any, and I was so depressed by the end of that. And then I, mm. I picked it back up and then I smoked every day, all day for two and a half years after that until the next time. But <laughs> that was the, that was the first time. <laughs> Man, a, a lot of, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, one thing that really stood out is that you said you started to own your part. And that just shows a lot of maturity, right? You're like, okay, I was at fault in some of these things. And I think that does take a level of, of maturity and just consciousness to realize that, hey, like, you know, it's not all them. And I think that's a big issue a lot of people have that when they get into recovery, uh, not you guys, of course, but uh, other people, right? And you see it a lot in, in, in support groups, right? They go in and they're just mad at the world. And hey, you know, it, it's, a, it's a phase I think a lot of people go through. So there's no judgment. At some point, though, they realize, OK, like I'm just holding this hot coal like and everyone else like expecting everyone else to get burned. And I'm just like my hands on fire. <laughs> yeah, like, you have to learn how to put out that coal. And that often comes from looking inside and doing the inner work. So really cool that you did that. Um, and yeah, I, I'm interested, like you said, you you took that that two months off and you were super depressed. Like why? Why do you think you were depressed in that period? Part of it was, I won't say like the COVID itself, but just the fact that like every, a lot of things were closed down and like life was limited and it's like, okay, well I can play Xbox and watch movies still, but uh, no weed. Like, like, you know, so a lot of like the ideal weed things uh, was what I could do. And I was not used to that, but I had just quit my sales job to become a full-time entrepreneur. So mm -hmm. I had finally gotten enough income from the online endeavors that I was doing, one of them I'm not even doing anymore. So like one of them was like a failing endeavor, but mm. it, I didn't know yet. And I was not making much money. Uh, really right. like 2020, the financial aid, like I needed that at that time. Like I was live, I, I was mostly broke cu coupled with this, coupled with me realizing, damn, should I have broken up with her or not? So I, it was just kind of like the trifecta of, um, of all of that. Although I will say each of the three times that I quit weed and, and uh, you know, went a substantial uh, level in the process, uh, all did have that period where I felt chemically depressed, uh, like for no reason. Um, anhedonia is, I believe, what it's commonly uh, referred to, just a loss of joy. And it's weird because you're like, yeah. even uh, this third time where I was like, okay, like I don't have nearly as much of a, a money issue as the other times and like things are good. And I've got this and this to look forward to. But like, I am not as happy as I should be about it. Like you, mm -hmm. I really did feel a bit chemical depressed. Um, yeah. But having financial troubles, it, it, that's always the biggest stressor. And it's difficult to because now you can't like treat yourself to like a nice lunch to to get over your weed addiction. So w when you've got that going on top of it, it does make it really difficult. But at the same time, the weed could also be the thing that is giving you the financial troubles. Weed's not that expensive. It, it does cost money and it also costs the time going there. But then it costs the speed that you lose when you're high because it's definitely not a performance enhancing drug. So now you're slower. And then, uh, yeah, you don't always see the, the right solution. So, um, you know, just, just with the speed, the money, and then the time that you're wasting on it, it's making it take longer to get out of your financial struggle, even though you might uh, feel better about it while it's happening. You, know, you might be like, yeah. oh, well, like I'm high. I'll figure it out. Like you, you can treat it uh, a little bit more happy-go-lucky is the only benefit. Totally. And, and as you guys know, when you, you smoke, it suppresses that pain in the moment, but the pain's right there when you, when the high wears off. And, you know, there's a reason why NFL players use it to numb the pain they get from running miles an hour to each other for, for 60 minutes. Like, yeah, it suppresses the, the, the pain, the physical pain, emotional pain, et cetera. Uh, I really think it's interesting too, that like you talked about the anhedonia and, you know, just from, from listening to what you said, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like not only were you inside and you're an extrovert so you couldn't really go and socialize you were just kind of zapping your dopamine with netflix and video games and you weren't and you were coming off the weed so that's just a concoction of just misery like that sounds like hell like i know today like even like having been sober for a while if i go and watch tv for too long i get my like my dopamine is depleted so doing that 24 7 i imagine yeah that was just a 
just a nightmare. And what I was working on at that time was two projects. One was an invention that never saw the light of day and never sold mm -hmm. anything. So like the thing I was working on was doomed to fail. And then the other thing was a webinar that I was going to run $10,000 worth of Facebook ads to before realizing that also that was not going to work. So like both of my like entrepreneurial endeavors were not good. Like, and that, that's all I had. I already quit my sales mm -hmm. job. I, I cut the cord. I was like, I can do this. I'm, a, I'm making enough to make, get by, but I just need to like give this my full-time energy um, but yeah, both, both of those were, were failures, which were like necessary failures, but I mean, it's, it, it definitely doesn't help to be, you know, fiending for that extra sale. Like I, I would sell yeah, some yeah. of my program to make between one and like 3000 a month is usually what I was okay. making. So I was like barely making expenses okay. uh, each yeah. month. Yeah. yeah. Guys, if you're out there and you're trying to get into entrepreneurship and this isn't to discourage you, but no, like there will be failures. And so I totally empathize, Derek, like, you know, you quit your, your, the thing that was working for a thing that, you know, your passion, your dream, and it didn't pan out. And I can relate to that because I dropped out of school three times to pursue music. I spent nine years DJing, producing music, and I made absolutely zero dollars from it. Oh, damn. <laughs> and it was only about, what is it? Uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago where I said, okay, enough's enough. Like I got to do something else. I got to find another way to survive because otherwise I'm going to be 45 years old in my studio apartment trying to make it to ultra. <laughs> and it's just, it was just like, I just saw the future. I'm like, Oh crap. So I did pivot and I pivoted and I failed. I got into real estate. Uh, I sold zero houses. Um, I got, uh, and I started the YouTube. I started a couple other things and, and those didn't work. So it's just, you know, it's part of the journey. And so today it sounds like you're at a much better place with all that. So can you, you know, catch us up to speed on what's going on in your life and, and how things have progressed? Yeah. So then two and a half years later, I, I hit the the wall again. And it was actually uh, with another girl situation where I was like, the weed did not help me there. And uh, I can see that this is a lesson that will keep repeating where as much as I like once I got to, like the, the reason why I relapsed after day 50 and just like stuck with it is I was like, I'm making a weed decision about this girl that is not even in my life anymore. And mm. I wasn't really preparing myself for like, just know when the next girl comes, you can't just be like, okay, I got to quit weed. Like right, right then. Right. Like you have mm. to be out of it. Like I have to be ready for that. And I went through this situation with someone else and I was like, that might have been the difference maker. And mm. I don't think this person was right for me anyways, but it was just a, enough that I could see that the universe was showing me, you need to have this out before these situations come up. And I started, uh, uh, and I got on like a streak of like 65. And this one was still very difficult because after two and a half years, all day, every day use, I still had like quite a bit of it in my system. Okay. And I went through the same kind of phases every time. So I'll, I'll say how my phases went uh, because hopefully you guys can relate to this. And if you know what to expect, then it makes it a bit easier. The first week I found very easy on all three times because I was like, you know what, fuck this, you know, and then you have like that behind you. And that first week you have, I think what's called the pink cloud effect. Like you, yeah. you realize all this extra energy and you're doing all these things in your life and, and you, you have all this extra focus and you can juxtapose it to the week before. And it's really clear to you of the benefit. And then the second week and the third week each time, was just like so much boredom. It was like, okay, I've been working nonstop for seven to 10 days here. And now I'm running out of steam a little bit. I'll keep going. But you feel like you don't have that break that you're used to at the end of the day. Yeah. And it feels like even if you do take the break, it your mind didn't register it as the break because you're used to like the dissociative escapism break that you're just like, I'm just like so high playing video games. And like you play video games and you like you play for like half an hour and you're like, this isn't that fun. And you're yeah. like, I used to play for two hours and it was so fun. And now I'm like, I can't play this that long. Like in movie, like you, you have to get used to doing all these other things, not high all of a sudden. And exactly. it makes it seem like the, that there's not like the work you're like, you're more focused. So you're loving it. But then as you're starting to run out of energy from working, yourself to the bone from the first week or two, then you start realizing like, where's my break? A and like I said, like you, you could take it, like, unless you go take a vacation or something, I, th I think that would actually be beneficial. Cause even though it seems like, well, if I'm on a beach in Mexico, I should smoke weed. 
actually like you forget about weed a lot of times like if you go to uh mexico and uh or to another country and and you've got a full itinerary uh that you know you've got enough going on to to process but it, it felt like i just couldn't get a break so okay. weeks two and three all three times was very difficult for me hmm. and then i started to kind of come out of it but then um day 30 to 50 which is when i contacted you this last time because i was like the last two times this is like the range that I, I can't make it past. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, by the way, the second time I, I was doing CBD products. Okay. And if you do a heavy dose of CBD, it is like THC. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not cheating. <laughs> like, I, I was like, and now I'm just like doing like hundred milligrams of CBD each, <laughs> like every other night is fine. Okay. Well, right, I'll right. do like tomorrow tonight as well. Like I, I you really get this perspective uh, sometimes like the relapses are, I won't say necessary because I think I could like, you can get past it, but they give you this perspective of what kind of weed user you are. And Joel and I have talked about this before. And if I get, if I, if I have it as something that's possible that I could do, then I, I do it. Like even my podcast, I've been doing a podcast for five years. I'm on episode 370. A lot of my interviews, dude, I'm, I like smoked half hour before it or something. Like I'm just like doing these interviews and I watch them later. I'm like, oh, cool. Like that was totally acceptable. But I, <laughs> I definitely could have done a better job. Uh, I was just doing work. Um, but yeah, so I was doing like CBD the second time around. This third time is when I did no CBD. And the there, there was three keys to it for this third time where I feel like I'm actually out of it. The first one was that I found out what the root of my problem was that was making me feel like I needed to always escape with weed. And the second one was that I accepted that this is going to suck. I love weed. Mm. I will miss it so much. And this is going to suck. Uh, I, there's going to be that like up to day 60, like some of those days in there are really going to suck. Mm. And then the third one was that those days that did suck, I didn't do anything about it. I just sat with it because oh. the other times I was like, I'm going to get a cigar. Like I'm going to do a little Adderall. I'm going to drink, I guess. I'm going to just do something. And I, or, or like CBD or uh, like I had like CBD weed. I'm like, I'll smoke the CBD weed. And now I'm like real close to it. Right. And there's probably some resin in the bowl that I'm hitting. And even mm. there was like two times within that second time that I was at my buddy's house and like drinking. And I took like, I'm like, I'm going to take the smallest rip, you know? And it still was just like, it really got the voice going again. And I like woke up like ready to to do it. And, and between the second and third time, there was only two weeks actually, because okay. I, I was like, okay, let me, let me try this again. I'm going to try moderation. I tried the moderation phase and I was just like, eh, every day, all day. Like, <laughs> like, I was like, damn, I can't do this. Like I, I wish like my friends will be like, why don't you just moderate? Why don't you just do it on Fridays? Why don't you just do it at night? Why don't how about just 420? And I'm like, it's, if it's an option, I will always convince myself of why I can do it because I'm working at home on the computer with no boss. And I'll put in this eight to 10 hour day. Then I get to the end and then I'm like, okay, it's time for a break. And then like, it's just, if it's an option, like I know myself, I'll talk myself into it. So I just had to accept that. Um, but I do want to address that that first point that I said where I had to figure out what was at the root of why I was doing this. And this is going to be a different answer for everyone. This is probably where the like find a, get a therapist and work out your childhood <laughs> trauma comes out. But I'll tell, yeah. tell you what it was for me because I think that this is a good starting place for a lot of people. And it was figuring out my attachment style. Have you ever heard of this before, Joel? I have, yep. So there's four attachment styles and, and basically one of them secure. And then uh, the other ones are basically somewhere on the spectrum of like an anxious attachment or an avoidant attachment. And anxious is in it, it's everything in life. I was anxiously attached to all my business goals. Like they have to happen. I, <laughs> I have to have the control. I have to work for myself. I have to be an entrepreneur and I have to do this and like relationships, right? Like you can get clingy too fast. You can try to move forward into making it a relationship too fast. Oh yeah. And that was more the side that I was on. And then like avoidant is like, you, you might quit goals because you're like, uh, like I might fail this goal. So let me just quit it now. Um, you know, so that I, I don't have to endure the failure. I'll just quit early or let's just, uh, I'm starting to get really close to this person. Let me just leave them now because everyone leaves me. So it's, it's really either side of the spectrum. Um, but I realized that I was anxiously attached to life 
And then I realized that weed was a huge catalyst to that. And I realized that at the root of all of my anxiety and depression was this was attachment was my issue. And then I realized how much weed, like all the cons became clear to me. Like I was like the pros. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I get to get away with it. I'm pretty good still on the mic because I'm, you know, my, all those things, all those things that I told myself all of a sudden I was like, dude, this is really like, th this is the root of it. Um, because when you see the problem is like, weed is my problem. It, it's what's making you do the weed all the time that that's more the problem. And if you just keep attacking weed, then that's why I kept like coming back to it. Cause you kind of forget why you're like, is it really that bad? Cause it, it's not that bad, right? Uh, it's not that bad of a drug. You're not, you don't wake up hungover. You're fine. You can just do a cup of coffee. You can wait an hour and a half. Like you can, it's, it's not that bad, but it's like those kind of things that can really just like the compounding effect over your life is is humongous mm -hmm. so uh, that that was it for me for like finding like the root of the issue that was really really key for me to see the problem for what it was nice that's very nice man yeah um you know i, I hear that a lot right it's not heroin it's not meth like it's just weed but like like you said it's like a slow burn and pun intended uh i have a video it's called the death by a thousand cuts and it just talks about how it just, you know, it's over time, you know, you just get a little sliver. Um, they do that for torture, actually. <laughs> this this got dark real quick, but they do that for torture uh, in the old days of like the Chinese war and stuff like they basically would just continually cut people with just very, very small until they died and bled out, which is crazy. Give them hits of weed. Until yeah. they <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible way to die, right? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, going back to what you talked about, attachment. Yeah, that's fantastic, dude. And we're going to be doing a lot more content on codependency, on attachment, on all that stuff. So we'd definitely like to have some more conversations with you on that, Derek. I'm the same as you. I have that anxious attachment. Um, it's played a I would say a very, it's, it's made relationships a big struggle and I've really had to work to overcome that. Uh, for me, it was because of an adoption. So I got, you know, taken away from a, you know, primary caregiver so young and I can't even remember it. So it's, it's very hard to get to the root to, uh, for me, it's very hard to say goodbye. Like I, I struggle with just like saying peace out. I'll see you next time. Like part of me is like, what if I don't? And it's like, all right. Like, so I, I got to work on that, but coming full circle here. Yeah. There's a really good book on that can maybe help you guys out. If you're struggling with that, it's called attached by Amir Levine. I read it a little while ago and it really kind of talks more deep into what Derek just talked about. Right about the different attachment styles, how to overcome them, where you might fall in and why you might behave in certain ways. So definitely check that book out. We are not sponsored. Uh, or it's a great book and we definitely advise that. And so, yeah, man, that's, that, that's awesome. You found the route. Uh, I think, you know, you're spot on, like a lot of people, they try to quit and they don't know the route. So they just, they're continually suffering. And you really do have to get to the root of why you started smoking in the first place. So besides that attachment, any other reasons why you think you, you, you like weed so much? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know like so why I like weed so much. I mean, it just makes everything more fun. And I, I was really the funny guy. I, I've always been the funny guy my whole life. And that was actually something I gave up with weed. Wow. I'm so much more serious now. You go through life just finding the funny in everything. And I'll hang out with people who are high now and I'm not. And you can just tell like their barrier for what's funny is just so much lower. Mm -hmm. And it was annoying. Like when, I, when I'd be high around people that were sober, like I'd find funny in so many things. And when I was in my 20s, it was so much more acceptable. In college, it was just always fine to, to be making jokes. Like everyone was, was fine with it. And then you kind of hit a point where the joke better be damn good or you don't say it. It's kind of <laughs> what I've been finding in my 30s. So it, I largely gave up being the funny guy. I think if I was a comedian as my career path, like the weed would help. Like <laughs> I could, I think maybe if you're a comedian, even though like I'd be yeah. freaking terrified of going on stage high for sure uh, doing a, a comedy bit. But I, I think that could help their mind, like get on the right track of just seeing the, the parody of everything in life. Right. Um, I mean, look at Seth Rogen, Joe Rogan. They're yeah. always stoned and they're always yeah. jokes for sure. Joe I think Rogan would probably be really serious if you didn't smoke weed. 
sometimes. Well, it was funny from since I've known you, I actually think you're you're a pretty funny guy. So I think it's there. <laughs> Maybe you just can't see it Thank yet. You. Yeah. It's still there, but dude, I was I was just like actively like always looking for the the joke. Uh, oh, now wow. I just kind of let it come. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, so I won't. Yeah, I, I'm just not as much like the class clown, like the obvious yeah. like, trying to get attention for being funny. Cause, mostly because I didn't have like I always say like whatever joke comes to my mind because I'm like that is too funny not to say. But with weed, it would just like it would like the thoughts would just all it would be throwing me jokes all the time. Like weed <laughs> would just make my mind throw me jokes all the time. I was like I have to say that. <laughs> like, so uh, so <laughs> that, that's kind of what it did. And then like now like there's just not many as many thoughts going in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I'm just a more serious individual uh overall which is just kind of what i need to be at this point in life yeah um joel the only other thing too that I, i've got like a lot of little tips for just making it easier if you think that yeah. would be good to touch on absolutely absolutely and we'll we'll transition to that in just a sec here uh the, the humor yes it is i was the same as you man just always cracking jokes is how i got attention so it sounds to me like you're maturing the fact that you don't need to crack every joke i think that's a good thing man that, you know you're, you're being more calibrated with your shots and uh you know i'm the same like you know if something's funny like dude i freaking gotta you know crack wise and like yeah. the first time we met like you so like i like to I'll be honest, like when I like to fuck with people and I'm very sarcastic and Derek gave me the same humor that I give others, like on our first meeting. And I couldn't catch it because I'm just so used to being the one delivering it. And I'm like, I'm like, damn, you got me. So yeah, I showed up. He's like, how you doing? I'm like, I'm high as fuck right now. And he's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so he, he dressed it really well. He was like ready to, to talk me through it. And I was like, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I was like, compassion, you know, just, we're gonna, we're gonna work through this. I said no, I'm fucking. Which was, which was a big relief for me. You train for Joel. You guys, <laughs> you pussy. <laughs> so yeah, that's a, a great transition. Speaking of, let's tra <laughs> let's go into some tips for the people that are trying to quit weed. So it is uh, difficult to say that you can do this without fitness in in some way, and find whatever you like the most. Like, don't make this harder than it has to be, but. If you are ever really wanting to smoke, there's nothing that will make you actually not want to smoke more so than getting in touch with your lungs in some way. Mm. So if you do like a, a lot of push-ups that can get cardio activated, but if you do like 10 pull-ups, if you get a pull-up bar, if you do 10 pull-ups, that gets you panting. And you will not want to smoke something, like the act of just like the mm. smoke itself. Maybe you'll still like kind of want the high in a way. But um, you'll have a bit of endorphins going. And then now just the fact that you got your lungs to a point of panting will make you not want smoke. So um, I, I've been doing a lot of running. It's not my favorite thing. I, I did like a 1.6 mile run today. I was so bored by the end of it. Like it's not my favorite thing. So you got to do what you like, like even a half mile run. Uh, I know people always talk about like, go run a couple of miles. It's like, dude, a half mile is like a couple <laughs> miles, bro, please. <laughs> that mile is like pretty good. Uh, so do what you like at the gym. But I learned that if I ever felt depressed, uh, really missing weed, bored, mm -hmm. and also not able to uh, take action in my business, I was just like not feeling it right. I'd, yeah. I, I'd say there's like one of three things going on. Either I haven't eight today, which was never the issue for me. Um, but I know that can be a common one if yep. you're used to eating on weed and like now you don't have as much of an appetite. So to that, I would say get meal replacement shakes so that you can at least just like just chug a chocolate shake and now at least get like 40 grams of protein and like all your, your base. So that's not an issue. And then the second one would be that I didn't sleep the night before. And this is something that I never realized on weed because if you got okay. four hours of sleep, and then you're high and you're like, oh man, I'm so high. Like, but, but you're actually really tired too. And then you don't even realize it because you're just like, dang, like I'm, I guess I'm just crazy high. So like I never realized how bad lack of sleep was affecting me until I had that removed. And then I was like, why am I tired? It must be the sleep. Otherwise I was like, it must be the weed. Like it must, I would just always blame it on the weed. So yeah. then I started to see like, dude, like when I get seven or more hours versus less, like. I can control my mood so much better. So uh, you really got to figure out some sleep strategies. And really, I like to 
all these little things, the reason why it's so helpful is because they all feel like you're doing something. And that's partly what you miss with the weed. It's not just the weed itself, but it's just like, what, what do I do? So I'd be like, I'm going to do a magnesium tonight. I'm going to do a melatonin. I'm going to uh, turn on my red LED lights and prepare me for bed. I'm going to like put on my blue light glasses before bed. Like all these little things. Uh, I'm like, oh yeah. And then I take a hot bath before bed to make my body more like it, prone to sleep well. So like you can make a game and like do things like that are healthy. Like, like I'm going to do a B12 today, right? An omega-3. Like you want to give yourself things like that, like pre-workout or you know, that's not the healthiest thing, but whatever. Like, well, I, I don't think you should try to get rid of every addiction at once. I think that's pretty difficult. Yeah. Uh, so like, and then coffee was a lifesaver, but, um, you know, all those things like, so sleep would be the other thing. And the third one is I haven't worked out today. So I learned to just say like, if I haven't worked out today, then I'm not going to trust my thought process right now. And I'm going to try to get myself to go work out and just go do something. And then I'm going to come back and consult this because I remember there was a time that I was like on like day 15 one time and I was like calling through my friends, right? Like this is the other, like you're going to, you you might use your friends as therapists for a day. <laughs> and I was just like talking to my buddy and he's having a great day. And I'm like, I'm not bro. But, but he's like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't like everything's fine, but like, I just don't feel good. And then I did, uh, it, it was like an incline. It's like 200 steps in Castle Rock, Colorado. And I, I did that a few times and I got to the end of it and I was like, I'm actually fine. Uh, <laughs> like there's something about like getting your endorphins going, getting in touch with your lungs. And it's like, you, you could be uh, like 15 minutes away from feeling fine at any time if you mm. just make yourself do the fitness. And it's really annoying because you'll be in this, like this depressed state, you don't want to do anything that the motivation's low. Maybe you got no sleep. Maybe you're, you're hungry. Like all three are going on and you just have to make yourself just go do some kind of physical activity and then, and then get back to it. And that's what I was saying like that this last time was like, I needed to get through those depressed states. So, um, it, it, and sometimes you would do that and you'd still kind of feel it. And I would be like, uh, the way that I looked at it is I was like, this is the addiction leaving my body. When, when I really felt uh, like just like there's no way out of just feeling depressed today. Like I'm not excited about anything that's happening and I'm not quite tired yet. And I already worked out today and I'm, I ate like there's nothing I could do. Like I, I could go <laughs> like in that phase, you're like, I could go take a hit of weed. That would work. But like, you're like, I can't do that. Then I'm like, okay, what if I did alcohol? Like, no, like don't do like, just, just deal with it. Like, and I, I had probably like six or eight days where I just had to be like, just deal with it. But I, I kind of, I, as best as I could try to see it as like this, these are the days that make it go away. Like these are the days where my body's actually like flushing it out. If I can get through it, man, I love those tips, dude. That's, that's fantastic. That's, those are some nuggets right there. Those are some big nugs. And I, I talk a lot about too, like the importance of exercise for sure. So I agree with you hundred percent, like getting that natural high, right? Like, cause we still want to get high. We're, we're, <laughs> we're addicts. We like to, or whatever, however you want to call it. We like to get high off something. So it might as well be something that's going to nourish us and replenish us. Uh, yesterday, for example, and you know, I still take these tips today. So uh, I appreciate you, re you reminding me too. Yesterday, you know, I, I didn't get much sleep either. So it's funny, like you're saying this, I'm like, yeah, this was me yesterday. I had like six and a half, seven hours of sleep. So I had that like drunk feeling. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but when you're a in lack of sleep, it's the same effect of being drunk. So I noticed that in the last probably three years that when I don't get that seven, eight hours, but even seven is too low now, like I feel like drunk. So I was feeling drunk yesterday. My mood wasn't super great. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go play hoops at the end of the day. Right. I'm like, I really don't want to go move, but you know, I'll, I'll probably feel better if I do it. Had a blast, like, like was balling endorphins were going, I was just sweating and then afterwards, the guys I was hooping with were like, dude, let's go get a lift in. So because the, the basketball gyms were right next to the weights. And so we just like did like a, I don't know, an hour just rage session of lifting. And like I felt so great after and all the depression I had, all the anxiety was gone. I felt connected again, connected to people, connected to myself. And so it was just like a good lesson. Like, yeah, dude, like if you can, I like just how you said it. You were I was 15 minutes away from being happy. And in that decision, I decided to go chase happiness instead of, you know, go be in my misery in the pity pot, as they call it. Uh, so those are great. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and anything else, man, <laughs> dude, keep it rolling. This is a... 
This is cool. Yeah, uh, I did prepare a bit for this. So oh. that's why I've got like these concrete tips. And I think I've given all the things that I prepared for. And I think the great thing about that is there's not that much extra to it. It, it is just knowing that it will suck for a bit. And I'd say that if you've been doing heavy use for multiple years, then your timeline will probably be similar to mine, where the first 60 days you're going to have at least 15 days that are really tough, another 10 that were just kind of like boring days, and another 10 to 15 that you are feeling all the positive benefits and are, are loving it. Uh, just know that once you get past that day 50, day 60 mark, right, right now I'm on day 62 as well. And I was telling Joel, I was like, should I wait till 90? But like, I do feel really good right now. I, I feel like I'm out of it. And it, it's partly because before, up until day 62 here, I had just two weeks of a little bit of use. And then I had 65 days before that. So mm. I didn't have nearly as much of a baseline going into this one. I feel like probably more similar to how I would feel if I made it like 90 days or more from the other times, just because there's not uh, as much residing uh, in me. Um, but I really had, oh, oh, actually, there is one other thing that I want to talk about. And that would be getting on purpose because it's just a, it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass conversation. I have like, you just like find your purpose, right. And get on purpose. <laughs> and I've gone through phases of life where I feel like I'm on it. And then other times that I'm not, and it's such a hard question to answer because you're like, what does that mean? Like I have to start a charity or I have to like give all, give my money away. Like I have to retire my parents or like, do you, like, do you have to have this phil uh, philanthropic? Is that the right word? Philanthropic. philanthropic, I think it's philanthropic. Uh, you know, type goal in order for this to like mean anything. And I realized that purpose is more of a, a feeling you get about what you're doing. Um, although you could be doing the actions that are in line with your purpose right now. So for instance, when I had my sales job selling knives, when these kids would start the job, no one was excited about selling knives week one. Like they're, they're 18. They're like, eh, what are they? Like they don't even cook yet. Right. They're just trying to sell them. And then after a couple of weeks go by and they start to get those initial sales. And then they start to realize, man, there's a lot of people making a career out of this and I can do this and I can see myself constantly improving every week and you can win a company trip. And I feel like I could actually do that. If I, if I really like set my mind to it, I could actually do that. And it's more of an understanding of what you're creating is when you'll feel on purpose, even though that person was still selling knives week one, but they didn't feel like they were on purpose. Hmm. So it's more, uh, I, I do feel like your, your initial purpose in life, your initial extrinsic purpose will be whatever makes you money and, and what, and you having fun doing it because yeah. it's very hard to do. Oh, I want to open a charity. You, you need money. Like <laughs> I want to retire my parents with what money? <laughs> uh, like, Love. like you're going to need money to do like whatever your next level goal is. So your an initial like purpose, like your actions will be what gets you money. But if you don't, if you feel like I'm doing that, but I don't feel on purpose, I think it's either because you're doing something you don't enjoy or you're not that confident in the path you're in. So as an entrepreneur, a lot of times I'm like, I'm doing the motions, but like my, my YouTube videos aren't really doing that well. Like my thumbnails, I'm like getting them better, but like, they're not doing that, that much better. So like, and then my offer, I'm selling less and less of it. I'm like, as, as soon as you are like, you're doing all these things where you're like, I'm not sure if what I'm doing is right. And, and when you're in that phase, then it's hard to feel on purpose. So you have to really get through it and, um, you know, consult with other people. And once you get on a path that you feel like I'm doing the actions that I'm doing right now will get me results and I'm enjoying it is when all of a sudden you'll, you'll feel like you're on purpose, even though you were doing the same thing as wow. what you were doing before. And how that relates to addiction is that purpose is, as everyone knows, like that that constant motivation. Like I've been on a tear recently. Like I was telling Joel beforehand, we're, we're like, it's like 11 PM. I'm like, I can get like three more things done. And, and then like, as long as I get a good sleep still, and then I'll wake <laughs> up and I'm just like, dude, like, I'll just be going to bed. I'm like, dude, I'm just so excited to like hit the do to do list tomorrow. Like and I'm, it, I'm loving that I'm in that phase. And when you have that, then you can, it's so much easier to, to not think about the addiction and for it not to be mm -hmm. a thing. Otherwise, if you're like, I don't know what my purpose is and like, damn, I miss weed. Like it, it just makes it that much harder. So you're gonna have to, 
you know, really get on purpose, but it, it's probably not this fancy charity that you need to start or this, you know, next level thing. It, it could be doing exactly what you're doing right now mm -hmm. um, or, or making a slight career change, may, maybe moving to like, I, I, like uh, I, Taylor's on the call. She's a realtor. And maybe she's like, you know, what? I'm just sick of selling real estate in Colorado. Like that's it. Oh, I just need to sell real estate somewhere else. Like, it could just be like a slight pivot. Um, but to just feel really great about what you're doing and really confident that what you're doing is going to, to achieve your, your financial goal. Cause I, I really think your first purpose is to get finances in order. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. I, I did make that, that mistake. I chased the, the love of doing, uh, pursuit and, you know, finances were at the back of my mind too, but, um, now I'm really putting finances first and it makes a big difference. Like same as you wake up excited, you know, the little problems are like, all right, this ain't a big deal. Like I got bigger things to worry about. And so I got to get a girlfriend before I worry about this financial problem. <laughs> I would actually go. Yeah. I would go reverse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely bad, bad choice there, but yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, that's so, that's so key. Like, sometimes the purpose is exactly what you're doing. Like I could say like my purpose is to do this in life, but my purpose right here is to sit with you and talk. And I'm a big fan of this guy, Eckhart Tolle. He does the power of now. He wrote like the, the new earth. And he talks about how you have an inner purpose and an outer purpose. And it's interesting because he, he isn't religious, but he uses a lot of religious texts and analogies so the cross for example like in a sense and i'm not christian either but jesus represented the perfect harmony of your outer purpose which is the horizontal uh which is you know relationships making money your job career and then your inner purpose which is finding out who you are uh, letting go of different ego identities and stuff and becoming more of a present being and basically jesus just embodied that perfectly and that's what the cross actually represents that just perfect embodiment of inner and outer purpose. And so that's really, I think our mission here too is, is to maybe simplify it is that like you want to have, you want to find your outer purpose the thing that's going to get you money. That's going to like, allow you to have relationships, but then you also have to find the inner. So to me, it sounds like you have a really good balance right now. Like you're really working hard in the outer and because you quit weed, now you're more in touch with the inner. So you're, you know, you're becoming more, christ-like in a sense not in an ego egoic way but you're just becoming more like you know more of the universe we're gonna let's clip that <laughs> we'll end it right there <laughs> <laughs> you're like jesus christ and me nodding my <laughs> head <laughs> and that's the last podcast is about you <laughs> yeah. oh yeah so i think about that a lot too like guys if, if you're not finding the success in the outer if you're not you know the money's not rolling in like you can always go inwards you can always do work on yourself find out who you are um, find out your likes your dislikes your passions do therapy work if you have to do trauma work preferably with a with some like someone that's trained not your best friend because that could get burdensome but um but yeah there's always work you can do and this kind of comes full circle to what you're saying like you got to embrace the suck and, it, and, and you had that mentality this time. You're like, you, I just, you know, it's going to blow. And th that's such a important lesson for life too. Even at seven years clean, some days aren't always pleasant. Sometimes there's something, you know, a difficult conversation I have to have with somebody that's close to me. And it's like, oh, this is going to be painful. And I think about it all day. Like there it's, it's never perfect, but you know, those highs that you get from just living sober, living your purpose, like what Derek's been talking about, will outweigh the negatives by by a ton. And it'll keep you going. Like, it, you know, I don't know if this is the best analogy, but you almost get addicted to life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's way better than just, you know, you know, cashing bowls every day, for sure. At least it was for me. So a question Absolutely. I have for you. Yeah. So a question I have for you, Derek, is, why did you seek out help this time? Because it sounds like you tried to go alone. Yeah, something you were just saying there is, is why, which is don't mm. talk to your friends that <laughs> <laughs> aren't therapists or, or whatever. <laughs> so like I, I was joking with Joel because I was like, dude, I'm like playing Xbox live stream at night. And I'm like, yeah, I'm on day 27. It's It's been rough. And they're like, I'm high right now, man. <laughs> and I'm like, like, how is it? They're like, oh, it's, not, <laughs> it's not fun. I'm like, like, I told them, like, I, like, don't tell me it's fun. Like, just like, don't tell me about it. And, and like, I'm just playing with two people, like smoking weed, like while I'm on Xbox with them. And like, that's fine. Like it, it works for them in life. They didn't have nearly as much of an addiction I have. 
But besides the point, I was still just like, they can't give me advice that I need. And like, they can say like, yeah, good, good job. Like stick with it. Cause I, because I told them to, right. Um, but even before then, like the initial times are like, yeah, if you want it, I'll give it to you. You know, like, so like I, I had to like start telling them like, if I ask for it, don't give it to me. Like, it, it, mm. right. So I had friends okay. like that. And um, yeah, I was, I was going through a lot of calls like a uh, day, like 20 to 30 this last time. Uh, and, and every single one of them smokes weed. Like even one of my friends was like, yeah, dude, I took 10 months off. It was great. And then I got back on it and I realized that I really like weed. And I was like, that's not what I need to hear right now. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thanks, man. So I think it flows a little uh, bit better with his right. life. But he he does it like every other night, right? Like, so I'm like, none of you like did it like I did it. Like none of you did it like like 30 seconds after waking up to like, <laughs> like, oh, my good night hit uh, Vindica, <laughs> right? Like, uh, so like I just like none of you like – that's the other thing you have to like realize that other people's weed stories don't matter after a while. Like mm. you want to take them all in. Like you're listening to us right now. You get some things out of this. There's going to be things that I experiences that I had that uh, you won't have. And mm. you got to like really know that it, it is just all, at the end of the day, it's you and weed relationship, not my relationship and then you are tagging on to my like my story like you can there's lots of benefit that you can get from listening to all these people and relating but you'll you'll find like nowadays i'll see people come up on my feed like 90 days weed clean and i'll listen to them like this doesn't offer me value anymore because i already know me and weed's relationship doesn't work it, it would be like saying like oh yeah you dated that girl too like, you know, like, yeah, I, like I did as well. And like, this is the relationship that we had. And this is a relationship you had. I wouldn't be like, wait, you guys had fun. Wait, you guys, <laughs> damn it. Like I, I got to get back with her. She beat me. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> God dang it. Yeah. So it, it, it really is like that. But um, yeah, I, I sought out Joel because I was like, I just need someone that I can tell like, yeah, I'm going through this and, and he's been through it before and he's not going to be like, hi, while I'm talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, then we got to really talking and, and Joel and I are on the same path with so many things because like right here, he's like Eckhart Tolle. I'm like, yeah, I, I love Eckhart Tolle. Like we, we, you find uh, that we're, uh, we're uh, digesting so much of the same content. I'd tell him like, do you know this YouTuber? He's like, yeah, I do. And like, <laughs> I'm like, are you reading hundred million dollar leads right now? He's like, yeah, I am. Okay. So like we're, we're really doing so many of the same things like outside of it. And I was like, these are conversations that I haven't been able to have with my homies because they, they're not uh on, online entrepreneurs like like joel is too so there's just so much that we related to and we didn't even talk about we <laughs> yeah <laughs> the last session was pure yeah. business yep for sure yeah yeah that's awesome man and, and guys just like derek said like you might not if you reach out to someone they might not have that connection like derek and i have <clears throat> and derek and i have like very, very lucky to have to have met you derek and to be connecting on so many things I do think it's very important though, to get some sort of mentor, some sort of, uh, you know, advisor. And I still do this today in every aspect of my life besides like I have people for recovery, people for relationships, people for, for business and, um, people for spirituality. And I can go to them because again, just like you said, Derek, you don't want to burden your friends with your issues. Um, because a lot of reason they're your friends is because, like you don't talk about these deep issues all the time. Like that's why yeah. you're friends. Like you can just yeah. shoot the shit. And when you're like, dude, I just had this trauma come up. They're like, all right, man. Like I just kind of wanted to hang out and talk about yeah know, bullshit. <laughs> like this isn't really what I'm signed up for right now. Even your best friends have a limit. Uh, like if they're especially if they're having a good day. Like I told you when I called my buddy, I was like, he was like so happy and positive. I'm like. I'm depressed for no reason because of weed. So I'm calling you <laughs> like, you know, you feel bad. So yeah. it definitely is good to have those outlets and, and just use it sparingly with your friends. Otherwise I could tell from uh, like one or two of the relationships that I'm like, this is kind of um, it, it's ruining their perception of me in a way too, that I'm like always using them in this way. Like they, they know I'm like calling them for like a depressed reason. Like I'm like, this is not how I want them to view me as well. So having the, the mentor as that outlet, because I got a lot of friends that I can call and it still is, you know, you, you feel weird, like, because you'll, you'll, you'll get off the call and then a two hours later you'll feel good. And you'll be like, Oh damn, I want to tell them like, Hey, by the way, I'm fine. <laughs> like ignore all that <laughs> so yeah <laughs> definitely important to have a mentor yes absolutely and guys so 
you know, we're transitioning here a bit to the, to the close of this cast. There's some great ways to get mentors out there for free that you don't have to spend money on. This is what I did when I got sober. I reached out. I got into recovery support groups. Um, I can't say the names per se by their name because they have privacy. So basically what happens is people will like get clean. They'll say, hey, I'm a representation of uh, the Derek Vidal group community right and then they'll do something stupid and then every, anyone that wanted to get into Derek Fidel's community is just like all right man well if I'm gonna end up like this jackass like I'm not doing this so it prevents people from it prevents the, the possibility of people being deterred from the group and getting the help they need because someone wanted to you know shout it from the rooftops and make you know a bunch of YouTube videos on it so but however we can talk about behind the scenes so if that's something that you are interested in this right here, this is a free recovery support uh, guide. It's got like 30 different YouTube channels, support groups, forums, all things. The mo movies, too, that might inspire you. Books, the books and movies you have to pay for. But, well, actually, <laughs> there's ways around that. But um, you guys can, can download this for sure. Just enter your email, and then you can have a list of stuff. Uh, the one, I can't say the guy, I can't say the name, but the one that has marijuana in it, that's the one that I went to and I got a sponsor in it and they really helped guide me through the initial stages of recovery. Uh, going off that, a lot of people don't want that either. A lot of people can't relate to it. It's a lot of, uh, you know, there is some religious kind of themes in it and that can deter people. So from there, like I'm, I'm definitely down to, to meet with you if that's something that you have an interest with. And just like Derek did, we can kind of meet, I can help you kind of identify some of those struggles that you're dealing with. Uh, we'll have weekly one-on-one -on -one calls. Um, you can basically have 24 seven text access to me and we can kind of identify those blocks in your life that are keeping you from, from quitting weed. And, and just like what you heard today from Derek, it can be something that's just so simple, right? Like sometimes you just need a very simple tweak and then you'll be, you'll be off to the races. So here is that link right there as well. And you can, uh, you book a call with me and we'll, we'll hop on like a 45 minute zoom, just like Derek and I, and we can, um, you know, meet each other and see where, where I can be of service to you. So, that being said, uh, Derek, can you kind of, you know, give us some some uh, updates on where you are in life, what, what you got going on, on on the social media world? Yeah, I'm uh, doing a, an update on my course, a course that I've been selling for about five years. I've just sold it in all these different ways and repackaged the offers. And now I've done it so many times that uh, I, I'm doing you know, what I consider my last course revision and I'm getting everything set up. And I had read this book. This was partly why I was like so freaking jacked one night. I couldn't even like sleep because I was like, I know what I did wrong. Like my lead oh, back, that's not good enough. So yeah. I'm redoing, uh, I'm making a, a free course for people that have a business, but want to just launch it. Right. It, it's called my social launch formula to just like get an Instagram following, get a Facebook following, get a TikTok following, get an email list run a sale like all in one campaign it's like my own uh thing that that i've been teaching for a long time but it's so refined now but i just haven't had the inner workings of like like i told you i like used to do an ad to a one hour webinar and sold it this way and like i just haven't ever gotten the pieces right uh mm. and, and maybe i don't have it right this time but i feel yeah. like i do and i'm gonna act on it that way yeah. so i'm just super excited about uh re-putting the pieces together of this program that i know that works for people that get in it so that's the most important thing but i just haven't figured out the exact way to sell it and okay. then i just had a, another new invention come in two weeks ago and like three days ago the first person outside of friends and family bought it so i'm like once once that seal is broken i'm like okay uh i got something here is it, and, the, is it the bar? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, is it the what's bar? That? Is it the bar? Yeah, yeah. It, nice. it is the, the <laughs> bar. Yeah. I don't know how much. Like, I don't want to like, get into it or whatever. Oh, but, go like, ahead. Dude, go ahead. This is your. Oh yeah. yeah. It's called a back knee bar. It's a body acne bar of soap. I just kind of saw that it was a niche and that I, that I could probably take a, a chunk of that mark market. So. Oh yeah. It's a little Guys, far away right now, but I, I was I'm like, scars. whatever. I'm gonna try this. So. Uh, I have know, scars from acne, so I totally support the back knee bar, man. Hundred percent. Like it's. Fucking sucks. So I use it all the time. Like the fact that I'm like I prefer it as my bar of soap. So that's why I'm like <laughs> this, this. I'm onto something. Like that I use it. Like because products yeah. are kind of like the, either people use them or they don't. Like there's not like I like it, but I don't know if anyone else will. Like if I honestly use it, like it, it's actually it, it's funny to use product proof that way because my original invention. I'm like yeah, it's it's a pain in the ass to use up, but we could probably sell it. <laughs> but uh, you can't. Like if you don't yourself use it as the inventor, then. Uh, it won't sell to anyone, but yeah, so I've just got enough 
things that I feel like I'm catching fire on in business. And then I, I'm, I'm going to run a, a whole new ad campaign. And that's also another reason why I'm like, it's not fun to smoke weed while you're running Facebook ads to cold traffic at scale because you're like yeah. negative comments come in and you're mm. like, wait, are they right? <laughs> like when you're high. <laughs> so like, but otherwise like there, there's a lot of things like that. Like the, the judge in my mind isn't nearly as activated when uh. I'm high. So uh, yeah, it, 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 to play at this next level of entrepreneurship, it, it was not helpful. So uh, I'm about to just launch a whole new ad campaign to that. And, and that's why I'm feeling like really excited about this right now, because I feel like it's going to work. And even if it doesn't, then, you know, I'll keep going, but I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to act on this, this belief uh, confidently. And, and that's where I'm at. And that's what's opera. That is what entrepreneurship is. Just, you know, you take a, you see a, a light in the tunnel and then you, you head towards it. And sometimes it might be a fake light, but you know, you reevaluate and keep going, but run towards it. So figure it out. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I'm the same boat as you, man. Like we're again, it's just so crazy how similar our lives are right now. And like, yeah, stuff is, it, it's a great feeling once things catch fire and you know, it just, it'll make everything worth it guys. Like whether entrepreneurship is your thing or not, but when you find that thing in life that you, you know, you can wake up for and be happy for and get excited about and see results, it'll be just so worth all the pain with all the days of misery from quitting weed or even from just being sober, or any trauma that you've had in the past, it'll just be all worth it. So definitely don't give up on that. Uh, Derek, where can people find you? So I, I believe it's streaming from my YouTube channel too, but just my name, Derek Vidal on YouTube. I'm at social bamboo with an underscore at the end on Instagram. Feel free to DM me on there and you can just always check my bio link for whatever I've got going on on Instagram. Nice. Nice. And for, for myself, you can obviously sobriety university, uh, do a lot of addiction and recovery related content. We're going to be doing a lot of content here on not just marijuana, but relationships, codependency. We're going to have, you know, some, some different perspectives from, from the male and the female per dynamics. Right. Um, cause each, I think each gender has a different experience when it comes to addiction or relationships. And so really going to be diving into that. Uh, we have a community launching very soon. It's going to be called obviously the Sprite university community, and it's going to be, this round is going to be weed focused. So first off, Derek, we'd love to have you be a part of that community. And we'll, I mean, I'll be um, announcing more about it, but we're going to be doing uh, weekly workshops. We're going to, you know, it'll be a place where you can come and meet other people that are on the path of quitting. You can, you know, be a, of service to others as well on the journey. I, I can tell you that something that has really kept me sober is being able to share what I've learned with others. Uh, there's a point where I'm like, you know, like I, I got to a point where I felt like I've, I would say I, I mastered myself to a degree. And I'm like, well, like, this is kind of lonely. <laughs> Like, what am I going to do? Just run around like with all my little knowledge in my head? Like, no, it's like about sharing it and, and being of service to others. And so um, that's an also, also great tip to stay sober, guys. Like get out, do a volunteer activity, do something for your community, do something where you get out of your own head and your own stuff. And I promise like it might it might be enough to get you three more days without weed. <laughs> and then you got to do it again. But um, other than that, guys, yeah. Thank you so much, Derek, for coming on. This was an awesome cast. And it really, it was nice to be with somebody that's a professional <laughs> in, in the podcast world. You, you were on your shit. I was like, damn. It's sweet, it. dude. Glad I could provide. Yeah, I felt like it went great. I, I've been running the th th things through my head for this week leading up to this, but really I've wanted to do this episode for like three or four years now because like the first time that I was like, I'm quitting. I'm like, oh, at the end of this, I'm going to do a podcast on it. <laughs> but I was like, <laughs> I could never get to the end where I was like, I didn't make it. So I can't do the podcast on it. So I was, uh, you know, excited to get to this point where I could do it. Um, so yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yep. Awesome. Well, and thank you guys so much for everyone who tuned in. We have one quick comment. That's a hard part of the mental part of it. Uh, can't seem to be, get past it. Recovery member, if you're still on uh, feel free to reach any of us. We, we'd be happy to talk to you and, you know, give you some tips and, and stuff. And um, you're not alone, brother. That's, that's the most important thing here. You're not alone. So with that guys, we're going to cut, cut it for the night and uh, we'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out. See ya.